Hello. Welcome to worship at Madison Street United Methodist Church on this first Sunday in 2023. It is a joy to have you worship with us. Whether you're here in person or you're worshiping online, we pray that this service will be a blessing for you. And I have a handful of announcements as we begin worship. If you are here, we hope that you have picked up a Christmas ornament. Somehow we didn't pass as many of those out as we wanted to on Christmas Eve, so we're pushing those. Please take one. Um, if you want to give one to a friend who's not here, you may do that as well. Also, we have our upper room devotional books in the windowsills. If you're here in the sanctuary, if you want to pick one up on your way out, there are also copies available at the Commerce Street entrance if you would like to pick one up at a later time. We always ask you to register your attendance, whether you do that online or we're asking again now in person. And our Director of Connectional Ministries, Paige Eisman, has a word about that. Good morning. For those of you who do not know, my name is Paige Eisman. I am the Director of Connectional Ministries and also the director of Madison Street Preschool. Today, I'm excited to tell you that we are resuming our practice for in-person worshipers that we ended with the pandemic in March of 2020. We're going back to the use of our record of worship books or row books, don't you love that? We will have those out in each pew if you have not already seen them. If you're seated on the main floor, the row books will be found at the end of the pew nearest the center aisle. And if you're in the balcony, they will be found at the outer edge of the pew. We ask that you would take a few minutes at the beginning of worship to register your attendance and let us know that you're here. Madison Street members will fill out the tan registration form and guests will register on the green form. Once you have completed your registration, just leave the form in the book and pass it all the way down your pew so that everyone has a chance to fill out their form. Once the row book has reached the end of the pew nearest the exterior aisles, please just leave it there and I'll pick it up after the service. And for those who are joining us online this morning, we may not have a row book for you at home, but we do encourage you to fill out the digital attendance form on YouTube or in the Facebook description of our video. And if you are a first time worshiper with us in person or online, we encourage you to take out your phone or your smart device and text the word welcome to 931-740-1882. We want to follow up with you and answer any questions that you may have about our church. We are so thankful for each and every one of you joining us in person or online today. And we thank you for taking the time to let us know that you're here and that you've joined us by registering your attendance. By doing this, you help us all stay connected in vital ways. Thank you. I also want to say a very special welcome and word of thanks to our guest preacher, the Reverend Andrew Churlog. This is not his first time to grace us with his presence and a sermon, but I do want to acknowledge what a gift he is to Madison Street and know that we all look forward to hearing from him in just a little bit. I invite you to stand for our call to worship. A new day has dawned, a new year begun. The world turns to hopes and dreams of the future. We enter this new year with hope and excitement. O oh Lord, remind us that you lead us, guide us as we look to you and worship you.
pray with me? Radiant morning star, you are both guidance and mystery. Visit our rest with disturbing dreams and our journeys with strange companions. Grace us with the hospitality to open our hearts and homes to visitors filled with unfamiliar wisdom, bearing profound and unusual gifts. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. And when we offer our confession, we join the beautiful work of reconciliation, which begins with our reconciling with God. Trusting in God's grace, let us make our confession first in silent prayer. And joining our voices together, we pray. God of glory, you sent Jesus among us as the light of the world to reveal your love for all people. We confess that our sin and pride hide the brightness of your light. We turn away from the poor. We ignore cries for justice. We do not strive for peace. In your mercy, cleanse us of our sin and pour out the gifts of your spirit that forgiven and renewed, we may show forth your glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, Epiphany brings good news. The light comes not to sear and blind us, but to save us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand now and share signs of peace and love with one another. And as we sing our next hymn, we invite our children, ages four through kindergarten, to make their way to Kitts Court.
You may be seated. Our first scripture reading today comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, the 63rd chapter, beginning with the seventh verse. Hear now the word of God. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. And I invite you to stand for the gospel reading, which comes to us from the gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. Now, after the Magi had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, welling in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I trust everybody is awake this morning, being last night was New Year's Eve. That wasn't very confident, but that's okay. That's all right. It is great to be with you today. Thank you, Harriet and Jared and Valerie, for inviting me to be with you today to share this word, to share in the sacraments with you. And as we begin our time together, I invite you to join with me in a spirit of prayer. Almighty and loving God, as we hear your word this day, may our hearts be opened, may our minds be set anew, and may we hear as if for the first time. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Believe it or not, it is the eighth day of Christmas. How many of you still have your Christmas trees and decorations up? A healthy minority, that is okay. How many of you started decorating way back right after Halloween? Before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving week, or how many of you are crazy like me and wait till Christmas Eve to actually decorate your tree? There's a few of us left, a few of us left in this world. But we know the beats of the Christmas story by heart. It's so well known that even non-Christians, people who are not part of any church or even any religious tradition at all, seem to know the story. Jesus, born in a manger in Bethlehem, then we can get a little bit more specific We have the Matthew story where Joseph is uh, encouraged in a dream to not be worried to take Mary as his wife. We then get the Magi visiting when Jesus is a toddler, bringing gifts. 
If we hopped over to Luke, we find the story of Mary visiting her cousin Elizabeth. We find the the birth of John the baptizer, and we find the birth of Jesus, and shepherds coming to visit them after their trip. After talking about the Magi, we often close our Bibles. If we haven't already put up our Christmas decorations, they go up. We maybe do a mention of Jesus' baptism. If we're stuck in the Matthew uh, lectionary that year, maybe we mention his circumcision, but that's about it, and we move on to other things, and we skip this story that we read today. And I'm just going to say the quiet part out loud, we like to skip this story. We like to skip it because it forces us to encounter something traumatic and tragic in the biblical narrative and also points the fingers back at us for times in which we too allow the tragic and the traumatic to occur without a second thought. You heard the reading in our passage today, the Magi have come and visited They came, they went to the palace first, of course, assuming that the new prince, the future king, would be there in the palace. They were looking for Prince George of Cambridge, not King Ralph. So they go to the palace, they're then informed that no, there is no future prince, future king here, no new child has been born in the family. That sets off alarm bells for Herod who calls the priest, who calls the scholars of the Torah. He says, hey, where should this child be born? Where was the Messiah prophesied? Bethlehem of Judea. He gives the Magi the blessing, go out and find it. I want to go and pay this new king homage. They go find the child. They bring the gifts and the treasures. It is a wonderful story, even though we often loop them in with our nativity scenes up here. When they depart, however... They're warned by an angel of the Lord in a dream to take another road home. Because Herod, in fact, does not want to go honor the newborn prince, the newborn king, this potential Messiah. Instead, Herod wants to make sure that nothing can affect his place of power and prestige in the world. Which brings us to our passage. When Herod realized he had been tricked by the Magi, He was incensed. An angel of the Lord came to Joseph. Get up, go, leave. They get up, they leave, they flee to Egypt. Herod then sends soldiers out throughout the countryside. He sends people out to make sure all the young children in the area are killed. He's taking no prisoners. Even hearing the words, even the title in most of our Bible, the massacre or the slaughter of the infants, just runs a chill down our spine. How can someone do such a thing? The irony is that it has been done before. If you were to flip all the way back into Exodus early on in the Hebrew Bible, you would find in chapters 1 and 2 a story unfold very similar to this one. The Israelites have come from other areas. They've moved down to Egypt. Joseph was favored by Pharaoh. They brought them in. They begin to multiply, and the nation is growing exceedingly well. But the people in Egypt now become worried. What if our place is threatened? What if we lose our status, our privileges? What if a rival power were to come and declare war on us. What would these Israelites do? What would these Hebrews do? So instead, what they do is they begin to marginalize them. And when that doesn't work, Pharaoh gives orders that all the young male children be killed. It is out of that story that we find Moses put down the river in a basket, discovered by Pharaoh's daughter, rising up to a position of prominence, leaving for the wilderness, being called by God and sent back to lead the people out to the promised land. Now we flip forward to the beginning of Matthew's gospel, and what we find is again a story of having to flee, this time not into another land, but back to Egypt. As another king, another pharaoh, another leader seeks to do the unjust. 
When I'm teaching Bible, sto- Bible studies, I often say Matthew is the prove it gospel. Everything is referenced back to the Hebrew Bible. Everything is referenced back to something in the Old Testament, to some prophetic word, to something in one of the, in one of the Torah passages, to somewhere, sometime, there is some reference back. Here we have three of them. In our first section, as Joseph and Mary and Jesus, this young family leaves, we get the out of Egypt I have called my son reference. When Herod sends the people to massacre the children, we get another one out of Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they were no more. And then finally we get a third. As it has been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. This sets up a lot for the Gospel of Matthew. This sets up a lot in terms of pushing Jesus as important as Moses was, as this idea that Jesus is fulfilling something. But focusing on that part of the passage ignores the tragedy that has just occurred. I would hazard a guess that many times when we read this passage, we focus on Jesus being safe and secure, and we often gloss over the fact that all these children have just met a gruesome end. One of the most difficult things for us to acknowledge as human beings is the fact that we are willing to fight for justice and peace and love and hope when it affects us or when it affects our friends, or when it affects those we're closest to, or our family. One of the hardest things to acknowledge is that when it does not directly affect us, or our family, or our children, or our friends, we are perfectly content to stand by and do and say nothing. In the 1960s, Following multiple Supreme Court cases and the Civil Rights Act, African Americans began to go to public facilities, swimming pools, all across the country. And surely the people in power in those communities gladly welcomed them in, ushering in a new place of understanding and welcome, right? What happened instead was that pools were closed, filled in. What happened instead, that public golf courses became private country clubs. What happened instead is that parks were often sold, turned into private gardens. And what did most people do? Absolutely nothing. Why? Because it didn't affect them. All throughout history, it is replete with examples over and over again of the faithful saying nothing until it affects them directly, until they feel the pain themselves, until they feel the, tr- the struggle and the trauma, until they feel the difficulty associated with what is occurring. When we read the massacre of the infants passage, it forces us to have to look around to the times when horrible things happen in our own towns, our own communities, our own nation, and our world, and we don't say a thing. Because so often we are so worried more about our own perceived loss of standing, of privilege, of status, of what someone else may say, than we are about the question of justice and love in this world. Jesus goes on in the Gospel of Matthew to heal many, many people. Jesus goes on to make a massive difference in the lives of numerous people he encounters. Jesus goes on to call disciples. Jesus goes on to the cross. 
Jesus goes on to a resurrection. Jesus goes on to inspire and to lead and to guide in ways we have not yet seen. But at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus now preparing to ascend into heaven says, go into the world, baptizing, teaching all that I have commanded you, and know that I am with you. How do we reconcile that Jesus who tells us to go out into the world, to make a difference in the world, to love in this world, and the difficult reality that we often stay silent? It is a moment of silence, isn't it? It is difficult to just hear silence, isn't it? Let's think for just a moment. Why does Herod send for the child to be killed? He sends for Jesus to be killed for the simple fact that it risks his position and place. But what if instead he took another, a different course? What if instead of seeking to remove this perceived threat to his authority, to his power, what if instead he sent forth and wanted to make sure that the Jesus child was protected? What if instead he wanted to make sure that people understood how important this child could be to the world? What if instead he sent people to make sure that he was protected and cared for and loved? What if instead he brought him into his household? Then we have a different story. Then we don't have a story about a ruler worried about losing his place of power and privilege and authority. Instead, now we have a ruler who is showing the humility and the simplicity to step back. To risk it all for the least and the lost. That is what we are called to. We are not called to be the king in the castle. We are instead called to be out in the towns to be out in the neighborhoods, to be out loving and caring and bringing in. A curious thing happens at the end of the passage. Joseph is told in a dream, hey, it's time, go back. Herod has died. They pack up, they go. But when he arrives, he sees that Herod's son is in charge of Judea. So he goes to the next place over. Even just the thought that something could happen again pushes them yet to another place. The Christ child comes into the world to change the world in ways that we have not yet seen. We have some idea. We sing hymns of peace. We sing hymns of light. We know something is going to happen. We know something profound is coming. But yet we step back every time we see the implication of what that could be. And what that implication is, is opening our doors, opening our hearts, opening our homes, opening our hands, and working with people that otherwise we may not see. There was so much rhetoric today about replacement and what is happening to different groups in America. Who will be the next majority or the next minority? And it scares people. It scares us. And yet here in Scripture, we have a child born to an unwed couple who comes to save the world through the grace and love of God by teaching us to do things differently. 
And yet we cling more often to the temptation that Herod falls into than that same grace and love that Jesus calls us to. And no, it doesn't mean we're sending people out to go find people and kill them. No, what it means instead is that we choose to be ignorant or we choose to look away or we choose to say, no, not this time. Or we choose to say, well, when I'm in a better position, I'll help. Or when I'm in a better state of life or when I retire or when I'm not so busy anymore or when the kids are grown or when I, after I have kids. All the time putting off and putting off and putting off the work Jesus has called us to do. Christ's child came into the world and the first thing someone in the world did when they found out he had been born was try to kill him. For us to hear this passage means we must go forth and speak up, lay down our privilege, lay down the advantages we may have so that others have a chance at life, so that others have a chance at being, so that others have a chance to ask the difficult questions. On this epiphany, may our hearts be opened to new possibilities, to new risks, and to the risking of ourselves for the work of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we prepare to go before God in prayer, If you have a prayer concern that you would like to bring to the attention of one of your pastors, please email prayer at medicinestreetumc.org. You're welcome to tell us as well, but I always say, I don't always remember everything somebody tells me on a Sunday morning. Um, Maybe I'm better when there's a guest preacher, but uh, prayer at medicinestreetumc.org, and we list in our Friday email newsletter ongoing prayer concerns. So if you subscribe to that, you will see those there. Let us long for and ask for the light of God in Christ Jesus to drive back the darkness of human error, misery, and evil. Let us pray. Where people are lost and jaded in contemporary consumerism, where addiction to alcohol, other drugs, and gambling is causing ruin, we pray for the hope of epiphany. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where dictators rule without mercy or wisdom, where democracies are manipulated by the rich and powerful, we pray for the justice of epiphany. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where people are burdened and have no faith in the future and contemplate ending their lives, Where the long-term unemployed exist without hope, we pray for the light of epiphany. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where the church dodges its evangelical mission and where the church evades its social and political responsibility, we pray for the truth of epiphany. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Where the terminally ill face death fearfully, where people without purpose face life cynically, we pray for the love of epiphany. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you search us and know us, and you know we each have our hopes and expectations for the year that is ahead of us. You alone know what it holds for us, 
and only you can give us the strength and the wisdom we will need to meet its challenges. Help us to put our hands into your hand and to trust you and to seek your will for our lives during this coming year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most holy friend, you led people from afar to find the mystery child. Please keep alive in our hearts wonder and praise and make us eager to share that light with others without exception. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask these things, O God, in the name of the one who is the light of the world, Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of the ways that we join and partner with what God is doing in the world is through the giving of God's tithes and our offerings. If you've not already taken advantage of one of the opportunities that we provide for you to give, I invite you to do so at this time.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. You sent a star to guide the Magi to where the Christ was born and in your signs and witnesses in every age and through all the world you have led your people from far places to his light. By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from captivity to slavery, sin, and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread. Giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When they had eaten, he took the cup. Giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Take and drink from this, all of you. For this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for all that sin may be forgiven. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Dear friends, the bread of life, broken and given for you. The cup of our Lord, poured out, and given for you. As you come forward this morning, we'll, you may receive by intinction here near the altar, or you may receive uh, gluten-free elements off to the side. You'll also be dismissed by the ushers as you come forward. Your offering today during communion is for the United Methodist Church's Human Relations Day. This is a special support faith-based volunteer programs to community developers and programs to work with at-risk teams. As you come forward, dear friends, you are reminded that this is not simply uh, a United Methodist table or a Madison Street table, but this is a table for all seeking a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. So you're invited to come forward and share in these gifts of bread and cup.
Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, as we have shared in your bread and in your cup, help us to share the grace that you have shared with us with the hurting and broken world. Lead us to make disciples, to to proclaim peace, love, and justice, and to live each day in your service. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Friends, if you don't already do so, we invite you to check out our website. It's our best information to have a hub, of, our best place to have a hub of information, is what I want to say, um, for what's going on at the church, madisonstreetumc.org. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook or Instagram and want to remind you that next Sunday we have a new sermon series starting entitled The Path. It will look at the structures and systems we need in place to live the lives that God is calling us to live, and maybe even to keep the New Year's resolutions that some of us are contemplating making or have already made. Also, if you want to know more about what your next step might be on the path to discipleship, the Reverend Jared Wilson is your contact person for the pathway entitled The Climb. And now, friends, as we prepare to conclude this service of worship, I invite you to stand and let us sing together. Friends, we may not know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. Go forth confident in God's love for you and God's desire to work in and through you on this day and every day of the year ahead. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.